So welcome, welcome everyone to the, uh, to the soy lunch, the World Food Prize Borlaug Dialogue Symposium biggest event. We have over uh, a thousand people here today and um, we have uh, not only uh, delicious food for you to enjoy, but also some very uh, delicious and tempting intellectual uh, products that will be coming. And uh, for dessert, the Vice President of Peru is going to be our keynote speaker. John Ruan and Janice Ruan are here. Could, could you join with me in thanking them for their sponsorship of the World Food Prize? And we, we have our two World Food Prize laureates here, Lawrence, David, everyone knows your name. I don't have to say your last name anymore. Would you please stand up so we can recognize you? I, I will introduce Her Excellency uh, later before her keynote uh, address, but I'm so pleased that uh, Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations, Gerda Verberg, is here who led a wonderful panel this morning. Thank you, Your Excellency. And Ruth Onyango is here, the 2017 Africa Food Prize winner. Yeah. Jim Collins, thank you. Corteva for your wonderful address today and your support to the World Food Prize. And this afternoon, Liam Condon's here. He gets equal time uh, from Bayer. And, uh, <laughs> And, and Syngenta was here last year, I quick to add. So uh, we're, 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 not, we're nonpartisan in, here in the World Food Prize. Suzanne Clark uh, from the US Chamber, thank you for being here. We're looking forward to Tom Donahue coming this afternoon and uh, being with us. Members of our Council of Bio, oh, Gordon Conway. I was crying, Gordon, when you were talking and uh, getting standing ovation. Uh, what a, a role you played. One more round of applause for, for Gordon. So, so I, I, I have to explain to you I'm in trouble, uh, and I'm a little worried I may have to have uh, Officer Baker uh, more close security, uh, because uh, my, my wonderful friend, Nabia Kazi, where is, is here, and she told me today's her 10th wedding anniversary and she's in trouble with her husband for being here and not there. Nabia, where are you? Yeah, so, oh, there she is. Okay, congratulations. <laughs> and then uh, also, uh, I don't know if she's here, Abby Johnson, who worked my special assistant, it's her birthday. And um, she's, uh, <clears throat> you know, I'm making her work on her birthday instead of giving her the day off. But, uh, but I want to say a very special word of thanks to our soy organizations for their sponsorship. This is the 12th year of the soy luncheon. And please, please begin and enjoy your lunch. Uh, and uh, that we have uh, the United Soybean Board, the uh, Iowa Soybean Association, Soy Foods Council, the World Initiative for Soy and Human Health, all come together, have been sponsoring uh, this event. And um, I want to particularly, uh, Lewis Bainbridge is, is here, the chairman of the United Soybean Board from South Dakota. We were planning things about expanding our youth programs to South Dakota with him. And so we're going to be coming up to South Dakota State, um, this. And uh, Lindsey Greiner is, uh, is here. They're um, the president of the Iowa Soybean Association. Uh, so thank Kirk Leeds, uh, Polly Hubbard here from USB. Thank you so very, very much for your wonderful sponsorship of this. Now, I, I want to say a special word about Linda Funk. Linda, where are you? And that, so, so Linda uh, provides one of the most fun events of the year. She comes. Michelle Hussein and I and the three of us, we go down in the chef's kitchen, in, a, in the back room, back in the kitchen, and we uh, taste uh, all the various meat foods and things. She's, so this menu today, so you have to check it out, and there was all developed there. 
And, and really, this is Linda's menu. And Michelle and I are kind of along for the ride. And we convinced her we needed to be there. And, but we really want to taste all the food. And so my wife, my son, always complains that day as I bring home the leftovers and, and that. And she said, you look, you know, your belt's looking very tight. So Linda, thank you and the Soy Foods Council. Let's give them a round of applause for this. So the Global Youth Institute is here. This is the uh, first time I get to see all the students uh, who are here. This year we have 206 high school students. This is their uh, first time at, the, uh, at Des Moines. They work their way up in state youth institutes and they come from uh, 27 states and territories, 10 foreign countries. They're all out here, so all the GYI, Global Youth Institute students, stand up so we can see all of you who are here. So, the first one, first one in 1994, next year's 25th anniversary, first one had 14 students. That. But they wouldn't be here except for the 150 teachers who are here. Where are you teachers? Stand up, teachers. You know, we, we recognize the students a lot, uh, but we don't recognize teachers enough. So tonight at the award ceremony, there's a surprise we're going to do for you teachers. Uh, and that, yes. And I particularly want to note the, ah, yeah, so it's the Global Guides program. They're wearing like yellow buttons. And Global Guides is an additional program for educators that we organize. You have teachers sign up for it, so sign up next year. You're back. And uh, there's extra programs, getting to meet various specialists and experts and uh, get additional credit preparation you take back to the classroom. So we are um, pumped about that. So we also have U.S. Department of Agriculture Wallace Carver Fellows. This is a long list of youth programs we have who are here. Or we have some of the Wallace Carvers here. Where are you? That's not, not a big group of hundreds and that. And uh, there then we also have the Borlaug Ruan International Interns. Uh, here, so I think you're here, right? Where are the where are the BR interns? Borla, stand up so we can see you, and that past and present, past here. So these these are the students. They were here in that big group last year or previous years, and they apply and get selected, and we send them for eight weeks at these wonderful international research centers, and. Uh, the research centers are so welcoming. They are so uh, hospitable. They take such, such good care of our students that this year to help celebrate our 20th anniversary of this program, Crystal Harris and I reached out and we invited each center to send a member of their staff, one that works with our students, come here as our guests. We paid for their transport. We paid for their room. They paid for their registration. They get to go to everything as our way of saying thank you. So the Borlaug Ruan mentors are here someplace and that. So please stand up. Where are the 18 mentors who are here? You better be here. <laughs> thank you so, thank you so very, very much. And we also have a, a special recognition for a young student. And this uh, recognition is established in honor of my dear, dear friend, David Lambert, it was established by another dear friend of his, Dr. Manjit Misra, the head of the seed science department at Iowa State. Uh, it would be hard to put in words uh, all of the things that David Lambert meant to so many people, he served in Rome as the counselor at the US mission. 
He brought great energy in Washington and in New York uh, to uh, food and agriculture issues. He worked very closely with Senator George McGovern. And he was here at the World Food Prize. He went out, as he did every year, gave a lecture around the state. He was at the symposium. He went to the award ceremony, came back. I saw him in the lobby of this hotel. And he passed away on World Food Day. And he was so special to us. And I'm so grateful to Dr. Misra for establishing this award where we pick one student at Iowa State who receives a scholarship. And I'm so pleased that David's son, Walker Lambert, is here. And uh, Walker is making a documentary and of carrying forward his dad's legacy on seeds. Uh, and there is down in the uh, hotel lobby, I think near the elevators, if I'm correct, and they're a part of it. You can go down and preview it. It's just, it's going to be terrific, except for that one part where you interview the guy from the World Food Prize. Uh, yeah, here, so I, I'm, I'll probably end up on the cutting room floor, so as uh, happens. But um, I, I want to uh, ask uh, Manjit and Walker, would you come up here on the stage so that we can join in recognizing this year's recipient of the David Lambert Memorial Scholarship Award. And this year, very appropriately, the award will go to a young woman at Iowa State who is majoring in dietetics, so nutrition, right? So Dr. Haddad and Dr. Nabarro nodding their approval here. And she is an individual who came through the World Food Prize just a few years ago. She was out there, like all of you, first time Global Youth Institute participants. She was a Borlaug Ruan intern. And she has been a Land of Lakes global emerging leader. She's in the honors program at Iowa State. She's organized a students fighting hunger program. She's raised $7,500 to fight hunger in Africa, her own, and is uh, the, exactly the type of young individual that Norman Borlaug and David Lambert would be so proud of. I'm sure they're both up in green revolution heaven today looking down and very pleased that our recipient is Alyssa Doherty. Alyssa. So, so uh, well, you sure you want me to do this? Uh, sure, sure. I mean, you're, you're the guy who put up the money, so <laughs> this is. So, so uh, the prize comes with a thousand dollars that uh, will go to uh, reduce your tuition. So the check's made out to Iowa State, not to you. Um, but <laughs> in your, uh, our name, uh, President Winterstein, you know, insisted. <laughs> no, she didn't. <laughs> Uh, and, and, and that, but this is the kind of student that in the College of Agriculture and Life Science where you were dean and now you're continuing to at Iowa State University, just as Louise Fresco is through the first Borlaug Youth Institute producing at Wageningen. Uh, so we should have a scholarship for Wageningen. We can give out, yes, and that. But let's have a round of applause for Alyssa. So, Alisa, this uh, envelope is for you, and this hug is from David. Thank you so much. You. 
So everyone, enjoy your lunch. I'll be back up here for the main event uh, shortly. And uh, it's uh, the soy lunch. Uh, Linda is, I can tell just by looking, delicious. And the way everyone's cleaned their plate. <laughs> Wasn't it good? Let's, let's have a round of applause for the Soy Foods Council, Linda, and the Marriott chefs. And it was, you know, I'm already saying the date for our beginning work on next year's menu. We can't do it just one meeting, Linda, you know, I think two or three and that. I, I hope you'll take a second and pick up and look at the table tent on each table that lists all of our sponsors. Not uh, possible to do this. Uh, the World Food Prize uh, events, our youth programs, our dialogue, all depends on the generosity of our donors. And uh, so please help, uh, help us. And if you would, if you uh, join me, a round of applause for all of our donors. Yeah. Um, so this morning, uh, at each symposium session, I've been explaining how that event came about. I was having brunch with Marshall Bhutan and Anil Jain at Henrietta's table at the Charles Hotel. We thought about the India panel. And uh, I was uh, with Liz Schreyer in uh, Washington and the Global Leadership uh, Council event from yesterday came. I was uh, in Ahmedabad at the uh, African Development Bank uh, and uh, Gerda Verber, Minister Verberg was there and with Rajul and Sean Baker and talking about it. So now I have to explain to you how this uh, presentation came about. So uh, Barbara Wells, uh, who is here, uh, where are you? There she is over there, the Director General of the uh, SIP, the International Potato Center, uh, invited me to come for the International Potato Congress. And, uh, you know, being Irish, potatoes, uh, and, um, and, and I thought we could, uh, it'd be great to go to Peru. I'd never been there before. And um, so my wife, my son and I, we rode up to Cusco, and then I found out what altitude sickness is like. So, so at the Marriott Hotel in Cusco, when you're signing in at the desk, they wheel up oxygen and put it on your, on your nose so you, you can breathe while you're signing your name. And, and they pumped oxygen into our room. No, it's a true story uh, uh, and, and that. And uh, so Cusco and Peru, they're wonderful hosts. And the first night, uh, there was a reception in a wonderful uh, old building that was a uh, monastery. Um, and uh, I was there, a large crowd, and uh, someone said, uh, I'd like to, uh, would you like to meet the vice president? And I said, oh, the vice president uh, of what? And they said, of the country. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, of course, went over, and uh, there was the vice president, and I was introduced to her, and it was very nice, and we talked about, I asked her if she had heard of Norman Borlaug, and of, of, and ever been to Des Moines or Iowa, and um, that she was very gracious. And after that, there was a program, and she came up and spoke on the stage. And I said, oh my gosh, and what uh, an incredible uh, and inspiring and charismatic leader. And I've got to get her to come to Des Moines. So I spent the next several days um, sending notes and having the opportunity to speak with her. And uh, I'm so pleased that she is here today, uh, not only in her capacity as the Vice President of Peru, a position she's held since 2016, uh, but also in a new position as the Global Chair of the Food Forever Initiative. And the Food Forever Initiative, uh, run by Crop Life uh, International, or um, uh, Crop Trust uh, and International, and several people are uh, 
strong supporters and patrons of it, Jim Collins, Corteva, Gordon Conway, uh, Maria Andrade, I'm forgetting someone, but, uh, but she got all the uh, leader, leaders and, uh, of significance in the world who are all signed up being supportive uh, of her. The uh, vice president uh, was, uh, did her undergraduate work at the Universidad de Pacifico in Peru, and then went to the University of Miami. So she's a hurricane and uh, got her master's in science and did further graduate work towards a PhD there in, uh, in economics. Went back to Peru and immediately changed the scene by becoming the first ever woman to hold the position of Minister of uh, Finance and Economy. She's also has served as Prime Minister. She's uh, served as the representative of Peru to the International Inter-American Development Bank. Uh, she has also uh, led efforts to promote tourism in, uh, in Peru. And so she encouraged they son and I to go to Machu Picchu, and we did. And uh, I, well, what an what an experience! Everyone should go and uh, and and do that. Uh, put it on your bucket list. And um, and so it's now uh, she is in a position of global prominence. And I learned this is her first appearance before an audience in person in her new role. So we are doubly, triply honored to welcome Her Excellency Mercedes Arios, the Vice President of Peru, to deliver her presentation, Food Forever, Raising Awareness to Safeguard and Use Agricultural Biodiversity. Please join me in welcoming <clears throat> Vice President Arreos. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you and good afternoon to all of you. I want to thank particularly Ambassador Queen for his insistence, persistence, and charm because he's amazing. He was so convincing. And he said, you have to be here. It's a good opportunity to share experience, to know each other. And really, he let me be part of, of you. And I'm really thankful for that, because I met wonderful people with one dream, make this world a better world. And I really appreciate that, because it's so hard sometimes when you're in politics to see so many people dreaming in the same uh, how I say, in the same rhythm, you know, having the heart to put their efforts without any particular private interest, but putting their heart thinking about how, how can we build a better world for having less people being poor, having less people without hunger. That's, that's amazing. So I really appreciate that, and I really thank you, Ambassador Quinn. Among the people I met, of course, I'm very thankful for the donors that have put all this effort. Mr. John Rowan, thank you very much for putting all your effort. The world of family, I don't know where they are. Thank you. You're wonderful and very open also uh, receiving me here. And the Lords, I, I, I found them. I have new friends with them. They are always talking with me and sharing their information and their passion. And now that I will, I see more than almost 300 kids around, I feel that this is worth it, you know? Having all these young people involved, sharing tables with experts in agriculture, in nutrition, in economics and things like that. You see, here we're working in the right place. And since we're having food all, and enjoying it, I think it's a good time to talk about food and what food means for our lives. And I would say something that probably you know, but it's important to remember. The world today faces one of the most difficult challenges, how to produce enough food 
that is good for all of us, but that is also good for farmers and, of course, good for the planet. Food that is good for us. Today, health issues related to inadequate diets and eating habits are the main cause of death worldwide. More than 800 million people go to bed hungry. Some of are around our corner in countries that are very near to us, even in our towns, in shanty towns in our, in our region. 1.5 billion people that are stunted by nutritional problems such as anemia. And 2.1 billion people suffering obesity. So it's good to hear that you have a scholarship for a young girl that is doing studies on nutrition. Very good. You can help us. <laughs> Thank you. Food that is also good for the farmers. Smallholder farmers are responsible for 70% of the produce that feeds the global value chain. Yet, they still represent almost 80% of the world's poor. How can we build trade transactions that provide fair access to benefits? Globally, only 2.4% percent of agricultural transactions involve certified seeds. Very few farmers have access to technology and good practices. And developing world and in the developing world they lose an average of 40 to 40 per, to 50 percent of output every year because of pests and diseases. And third of course, food that is good for the planet. We've, we've probably all together seen the latest APCC report on climate change. Alarming. We are running out of time. At two, centigrade, two degrees centigrade, increase the temperature will be devastating for our food system and therefore for humanity. We are facing potentially 50 to 700 people million people being driven away from their homes before 2050. And rising conflict, violence, and war is imminent for this problem. Water supply will be not enough in our world. Moreover, and that means food for sure, because we were talking before that, how can agriculture can use so much water? Because we are water. <laughs> ourselves. <laughs> so we have to think about that. <laughs> Moreover, more than 20% of all cultivated areas and 30% of our forests are degraded, affecting more than 3 point billion people and producing more than 20 billion tons every year of fertile soil loss. The challenge is really and it is real and it needs immediate action. Extreme weather events are familiar to all of us, and they pose a real risk to our global food systems. Last year in Peru, we suffered one of the most intense climate-related disasters in the last couple of decades, the coastal El Nino phenomenon. Only a few weeks after severe droughts in, that hits the north, northern coast of Peru, producing wildfire, only a few weeks later, we start in, uh, with the rising temperatures. They follow immediately, abruptly, intense rainfall, something that we didn't expect. The, uh, the pronostics that we had didn't say to us that we will have an Ilocostero uh, even of that uh, magnitude. Then we have landslides, and rising temperatures, which had profound damage in the northern region. More than 800,000 people affected, and more than 3.1 billion US dollars, close to 2% of our GDP in less than three months. That's the economic damage that we have. This damage was critical in the agricultural sector, which in Peru is directly responsible for the livelihood of more than 8 million people almost a third of our population. 
This is one of the phases of climate change. For example, we can see another phase, and some of you are familiar about with this. Weed is a $150 billion industry, providing almost a quarter of our daily calories. However, the crop is constantly threatened by pests and diseases, which put us at great risk. One of the most notorious diseases is the fungus stem rust. In 1999, a new stem rust strain, uh, UD99, appeared in Uganda and began whipping out entire fields as it spreads toward the major wheat growing region of Asia. As soon as UD99 was discovered, the race began for scientists to look into the world's wheat diversity in search of new sources of resistance and breed more resilient types. Among the 175,000 wheat samples in the International Gene Bank system, scientists found some UG99 resistant varieties to solve the crisis. This year, Norman's Burlock Award laureate the young professor, Dr. Matthew Rouse, and we met him yesterday, I think he probably is around, <laughs> is one of the many scientists who conducted groundbreaking research that helped save millions of people in Africa of losing their crops. In this case, as in many others, scientific research and biodiversity gave us a way out. This is a picture of the Indian Highlands of my home country, Peru. Specifically, is, this is a, plot, uh, a potato plot located almost 4,000 meters above the sea level in Cusco. It's like 500 meters above the city of Cusco. Every year, rising temperatures are forcing potato producers to find fertile soil higher and higher in the mountain slopes. But eventually, they will not find any higher soil to grow their crops and be forced to lower their yields. And as a consequence, worse livelihood, more poverty. But centers at SIP, and Barbara is around. She's a cause I'm here also. <laughs> Barbara, thank you. They are using biodiversity to find among the more than 4,000 accessions, varieties that can withstand with higher temperatures to give the farmers hope and opportunities. So agricultural biodiversity is as important to mankind as the air we breathe as, and water we drink. It is our most important ally if we want to strengthen our food systems and end hunger in this context of climate change and population reaching 10 billion by 2050. It's a prerequisite for food and nutrition security. Without safeguarding and using these resources in a sustainable way, we will not achieve zero hunger. However, our cultural biodiversity today is at more risk than ever before. For example, in the last decades, the center of origin of maize, Mexico, has lost over 70% of its, its maize varieties. Livestock breeds, which are critical to livelihood of billions around the world and also provide ecosystem services to the agricultural landscape worldwide, are also in danger, with 70% of them at risk of extinction and more than 100 breeds that have been lost in the last 15 years. 100 breeds. If we don't take, do not act quickly, this trend will become harder to revert. And is to a large extent a consequence of consumer choice. Out of the 30,000 available edible plants, only 12, this is less than one account to more than 80% of our calories. And only four, 
wheat, maize, rice, and soybean account to more than 60% of them. Our diets are consistently relying on less and less diversity, uh, both within and between core crops. Less options not only means less resist, resiliency, but also worsen to nutrition. As an international community, we have already pledged an important commitment. Sustainable Development Goal 2.5 clearly states that by 2020, we must safeguard and use this agricultural bi bi biodiversity and ensure equitable access to benefit sharing. And 2020 is just across, uh, uh, around the corner, so it's very close, two years more. The good news is that implementing the goal is scientifically and economically feasible. It just requires conviction and will. By some rough, rough estimates, safeguarding all the main genetic collections around the world will cost less than 1% of the global expenditure in pesticides. As, and as far as smaller fraction of the US federal agricultural budget. And the scientific progress in the field, will, which is showcased in events such as the one we are now present, tell us that we also have signs on our side. Uh, by why it hasn't been done? There is a significant lack of awareness of the importance of agro agrobiodiversity for food security. Consumers nowadays recognize the importance of eating healthy and organic and other forms, but not necessarily eating diverse. And many private sector companies whose value chain really depends on biodiversity take it for granted. Also, the fact that organizations tend to work separately instead of joining forces doesn't help. This is why, in my role of vice president um, Congresswoman in Peru, I decided to join the Food Forever initiative as a chair. Food Forever is an awareness raising global campaign, which is focused on promoting success stories, good practices, and innovative projects to achieve implement, implementation of SDG 2.5. Through a diverse and dynamic network, that's why I'm here, because I want to build my network, we want to inspire the global community to take a stand to protect and use for future generations all the wealth that nature and millenniums of agricultural advance have given us. By all means, our main asset is our network. We have, have committed our outspoken champions from different nations, fields, and sectors. This includes, for example, renowned chefs such as Virgilio Martinez, researchers and World Food Prize laureate like Maria Andrade, leading academies like Gordon Conway, and policy experts like the amazing Schengen Fan from IFRI. And of course, the private sector. We have Jim Collins here from Coteva, who is helping us very strongly promoting the best practice for promoting our food forever. Our more than 30 champions are constantly providing us not only with their voices, but also their success stories, becoming a source of inspiration to new audience around the globe. And in addition, we work with a fantastic group of partners, organizations among them, SIP, Bioversity, WWF, Oxen, Qui Botanical Gardens, and many others. The Netherlands and the Crop Trust have been the promoters of food forever since the beginning, and they jointly provide secretariat functions. These two are joined by the FAO in the secretariat, who has as official customs of the SDG target 2.5 provide an essential institutional backbone. 
and necessarily to say all of this is ongoing effort is thanks to our donors like Germany, the Netherlands, Norway, and Switzerland. This initiative was launched first in 2017, and during the first year, we focus our efforts in building the network. But this year, we want to take this campaign to the next level. This is why we ask all our champions and partners to pledge a specifically a specific commitments to 2020. I know Jim did it this morning here. Thank you, Jim, for doing it. And that's why we're working together. We ask this, these goals to be concrete, outside the business as usual, and innovative, outside the box. We had greater results. This pledge will become the initial building blocks for our action plan towards 2020. And we are confident that the new organization will want, organizations will want to bring their projects and ideas into the platform. Just this morning, I have a young lady, she, I think she's from Singapore, and she said, I have a platform that can bring young kids to this process. I'm very proud to say that because I want to support that. Thank you very much. <laughs> and this is the kind of things we can do. Our only teamwork and call to action will make our initiative thrive. What are some of these actions? I will make some mentions so we can see examples of working together. For example, I myself have a pledge to lead a multi-sectoral effort policy, you know, to use our cultural biodiversity to tackle one of our most pressing issues right now in Peru, anemia. Almost half of our children under three years old in Peru are suffering from anemia today. That's like thinking of half of our population without future. And reverting this issue will need actions that extend far beyond the agricultural sector. When I was prime minister, we followed the evolution of anemia in every corner of the country very closely through our delivery unit in an effort that includes several ministries, including the Ministry of Finance, this is very important. Budget is always needed. But budget with, with a good goal and measuring results really helps. So I think we could, should talk with Minister of Finance to see that having good nutrition should be in their agenda, for sure. If we wish to scale up the efforts institutions like SIP are undertaking to, for example, breed bio-fortified potato varieties, we need to involve every shareholder and have everybody involved working together. Peru has managed to reduce malnutrition from 28% to 13% in less than a decade. And we can use that example. Thank you. And I think we can use that example to overcome this new challenge. That's why I'm so proud to talk with the Lawrence because you are involved in this process too. So thank you very much for doing that. I commit to leading in my country these crusades to focus funds and policy in where most needed and hopefully inspire my political counterparts in the region and in the world to follow similar efforts. Other partners, such as the Crop Trust and the Royal Botanical, Botanic Gardens, Q are doing other important scientific work to underpin implementation of 2.5 through the Crop Wild Relative project, Projects. These two institutions are leading an effort to collect many of the most important species of crop wild relatives, ensure the long-term conservation, and facilitate their use in breeding new improved crops. And of course, since Food for Every is all about raising awareness, we are happy to promote other similar communication efforts from, I'm sorry, that's the, about having the crop wild relatives. But this is another one we want to support. 
We are supporting other similar communication efforts from our partners. An excellent example is a campaign led by the International Potato Center called Imagine a World Without Potatoes. I don't think we can imagine that at all. <laughs> I mean, uh, I, I was talking with Ambassador Queen, and we were thinking about what will be Ireland, Ireland without potatoes and the famine? What will be ne the Netherlands or the Belgians without potatoes? I mean, I remember when I was a student of economics, one of my first class was, hey, you have to know that there are some goods that you abandon when you are a little more rich. And that was potato. Come on, you really don't want to abandon potato at the time, you know? And that, that happened all times. Now we have to recover the sense that there are food that can really avoid famine in the world. And potato is one of those. And can, with good breeding, bring up our people, of course, with better income for the farmers. So it's, we can close the circle in the right way, you know? So this is one of the things we have to work. And as a Peruvian and a foodie, I really simply refuse to do so, so we have to keep on that messaging and branding that we can really nudge consumers to value more the food that they usually take it for granted. It will happen with rice, I'm sure, and we can do it the same with wheat and soy that are our traditional foods already, but we have to think of many others. We have sweet potato here today, and we have all the researchers that got the award for having uh, sweet potato introduced in the right manners in, in Africa, and I appreciate that word, and they were awarded here also because of that research. So we are in taking better vitamins through that. Also in an effort to raise awareness of the importance of eating more diverse food, the Food for Every Initiative have partnered with the lexicon of sustainable of sustainability to launch Rediscover Foods. The initiative will showcase 25 crops around the globe which have been chosen for the nutritional value, potential for improving farmers' livelihood, sustainable production, and increased opportunities for women. Remember, poverty has a younger face. So remember that because once you start working with them, you can take them away from poverty. And we can have, with this work, the next superstars in the international value chains. The campaign will take filming teams to different production areas and centers of origin to capture footage of these crops and their, main, their impact in more resilient food systems and communities. We want to share with the world the message that a good cause can also can be a delicious one. Following my, my grandmother's advice, make them fall in love with, through their stomach. <laughs> this is the idea behind our most recent creation, the Food Forever Experience. Last month, during the United Nations Global Day of Action, Food Forever partnered with Lexicon of Sustainability and Google to use these 25 rediscovered crops to showcase how diverse diversity can not only improve health, but also flavor. Yeah, good. We gathered 10 of the most talented chefs in America and the world to present them a challenge. Who could cook the most delicious dish using these new ingred ingredients? More than 100 influential guests from the food sector convened in the Google office in Manhattan to try some of these exciting creations. And here we mix foods from different countries. Oyuko, which is a tubercle from Peru, with cricket. You have Oyuko and cricket soup. Cricket is from Mexico and it's very popular over there. So can you imagine that mix? It's very nice and you have good protein over there. Breadfruit nachos. Tef pasta, also an award here talking about Tef, and moringa salad were only, were only some of the examples that we, are, we were using. Some of these ingredients, such as breadfruit, are directly responsible for the livelihood of millions around the globe. 
Triggering demand for these products is a way of meeting the challenge I spoke about, about, I spoke about in the beginning of this presentation. Producing food that is good for us, for the farmers, and for the planet. By showcasing delicious food, we can promote more diverse diets, but also more resilient food systems. A cool and a dynamic way to underpin implementation of 2.5. And we want to take this experience to all corners of the world, showcasing each country and region agricultural wealth. Tasting the future of food means understanding the diversity within and between crops and livestock breeds is our greatest value added to the plate of food. I could go on with more of the exciting goals and projects that Food Forever is setting for the next two years. But rather, I'd rather finish by saying we need you. Nick, we encourage you to work with us. If you have interesting projects, new findings or ideas you want to develop or promote, please reach out and contact us. Food Forever aspires to be the platform in which every one of you can rely to make your work and voice come across. Together, we will do an important job for humankind and give the world a success story. Thank you very much. Thank you, that was wonderful. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. I will leave this and yes, pick it up. Thank you for your inspiring message. Thank you. So uh, I want to be the first to make a pledge. Uh, my pledge is that our forum here will be available for you next year or the year thereafter. If you want to come, bring uh, others here and track how you're doing, uh, we'll be uh, very, very happy to welcome you and all of them back here with us. So let's have another round of applause <laughs> for Her Excellency. And uh, I, I, I want to observe that Norman Borlaug and uh, Jeannie, Julie, it's, I'm sure you, you know this, but explain to me how the Borlaugs got to America was also because of potatoes, right? The potato famine in Norway caused the Borlaugs and others to immigrate, came to the U.S. and ended up up in, in Howard County. That's right, no wonder he loved potatoes, as uh, Jeannie said. So uh, I was thinking, you know, they're in Cusco. Gosh, you know, what if the potatoes hadn't been taken to Europe, hadn't made it, I don't know, I'd be in Galway someplace uh, uh, doing who knows what, and, 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 and Norm uh, probably wouldn't have had the Nobel Peace Prize. So uh, thanks, potatoes. I can't, I can't possibly imagine a world without potatoes. So, the, uh, so uh, we all need now, the symposium's gonna continue. Uh, there's an equally uh, full menu, just as we had for lunch on the symposium schedule. I wanna ask all the students, stay where you are, let everyone else leave, uh, and that, and the teachers are going too, so. And, uh, and then, so, Thank you again for being here for our lunch. Thank you to our soy sponsors uh, as well. And uh, I'll see you downstairs on the second floor. Okay, yeah. <laughs>